are starting week six of um, the Vikings, and t our topic tonight is Viking religion. Um, sorry about my miswriting here. I'm a historian. I can't count. <laughs> We're on lecture 11 and lecture 12 tonight. So lecture 11, uh, the first lecture will be on Viking religion, the mythology, and all of the stories about uh, who the gods are and what their stories are. And then after we come back from the break, we'll look at Viking religion and we'll look at the rituals and the feasts and the sacrifices and the various ways they celebrated their religion. So does that kind of make sense to you all that we, we do it in that way? Remember that the notes for the lectures are posted on the WebCT, so uh, you should be able to download those notes, um, and uh, it'll help you take notes for the class as far as spelling the words goes. Uh, uh, and I went through very carefully to make sure I didn't make any typos on those, and if I do have typos, I'll correct them as we go through. Uh, last week, we talked about Viking women, and I was kind of rushed at the end. I, I told you a little story that that came from the Norse discovery of America, and I mentioned to you someone named Freydis Eric's daughter. And she is the daughter, of, of course, of Leif Erikson, uh, of um, Eric the Red, and the sister of Leif Erikson. So she is just as interesting as her brother. Um, and she went to the New World. I told you the story about how she led the expedition to the New World and murdered all of her companions. So um, got her husband to murder the men, and then she murdered all the women. So um, she was a real Viking. <laughs> um, okay, I wanted to mention that. Uh, we're going to look at Viking religion now, and Viking religion is very interesting, I think. It's an old-fashioned, ancient, polytheistic religion, and it's very loosely organized, and it lacks a priesthood. It does not have a formal priesthood like uh, um, Christianity does. In fact, the local leading men, the local aristocrats, or the local rich, wealthy men, uh, whoever is prominent in the community will serve as a priest, just stepping out of his role as a leading uh, man of the community, and then just um, uh, carry out the functions of the priesthood. It accounts for the creation of the world and for the end of the world, which is a kind of Armageddon. And it's also related to the Hindu and Persian cosmology in some ways. And remember, I've been stressing the idea that the Vikings were Indo-Europeans, and they go their origins go all the way back to a common heritage, which the Indians and the Hindus and the Persians also shared. Uh, one of the most interesting books on this subject is uh, by Georges Dumézil, Gods of the Ancient Northmen, and he goes through and compares the Hindu and the Persian religion, Zoroastrianism, more or less point by point with the Viking religion. It's a very interesting book. It's kind of older and it's been refuted. He still has followers today, but some people disagree with him, and, and I won't get into all the arguments, but I find him very interesting and thought-provoking. So I, I recommend Georges Dumézil. Um, these religions evolved quite differently uh, from their common origins. But in the Viking religion, every person, every trade had a god, so that there's a god that rulers uh, look to, there's a god that warriors look to, there's a god that traders and farmers and poets look to. So, so each, each profession or trade had a particular god that they might have paid attention to. It's also geographical. In certain areas, certain gods are paid more attention to. For example, in Sweden, Frey is paid more attention to. In Norway, Odin. In Iceland, Thor is given more attention. So it's also geographical, uh, not just according to their profession. Um, the Viking religion recognizes everything in the cosmos as a necessary part of the cosmos, and it goes through and accounts for everything. It's a very logical system of belief about how the universe works and how reality works within it. Um, 
uh, you have to kind of piece it together because all the sources are somewhat scattered. They're, they're not all uh, saying the same thing. There are three written sources for uh, parsing out the Viking religion. Uh, the verse Voluspa, the Sibyl's prophecy, is one, and you're actually reading uh, parts of that in, in this assigned book, Poems of the Elder Edda, so you're reading part of the Voluspa in this. Um, Snorri Sturluson's Prose Edda, uh, and we, this is really the poetic Edda that we're reading here, but the Prose Edda, which was written a lot later, about 1220. The Heimskringla, which is a story of all the kings. It, it's, a, it's a series of biographies of the different kings, but before it does the kings, it does the gods and heroes. And so um, uh, you almost have this heroic tradition in the Heimskringla. And I'm going to do the sagas next week, and I'll bring the Heim, Heimskringla with me. I meant to bring it tonight, but I will bring it next time. OK. Here is um, a tracing of later runes, and according to the caption here, it says that this is um, uh, following the Eddaic songs and the Volsunga saga, and we're going to look at this picture again, but uh, if you would notice, um, just, just look at it, and then I have it kind of blown up, and we'll look at it again later, and I'll try to identify some of these people uh, that are shown here. And we'll see if you agree with me. Okay, the editor here doesn't identify them, but, um, but we'll see. Okay, Saxo Grammaticus's Gesta Danorum, which was written in the 12th century, also uh, da, has um, the story in it pieced together, portions of it, and so you have to sort of put it all together. Um, the story from the Elder Edda, Elder Edda is told in Jones uh, 316 to 318, and I'm going to kind of follow that version as we go along. This is Jones, A History of the Vikings, one of my favorite histories uh, of the Vikings, if you're looking for a source to look at. Um, before we go on, I might mention some books. I've mentioned the poems of the Elder Edda, and we'll, we'll talk about some of these things tonight as we go along in the Elder Edda. Gods of the Ancient Northmen. I might mention a couple of more books. Um, this is H.R. Ellis Davidson, Myths and Symbols in Pagan Europe, Early Scandinavian and Celtic Religion. She is a disciple of Dumézil, and she agrees that um, the northern religions of Europe are all related to each other and that they're all um, akin to the Indo-European religions, so that they're akin to not only the Persian and the um, Hindu religions, but also to the Greek and the Roman. And she's very strong on that, uh, on that concept in myths and symbols in pagan Europe. I've used her a lot tonight, uh, along with Jones and the history of the Vikings. And I might mention another book that is newly in print by the same person, H.R. Ellis Davidson. She's a woman. Uh, she's now a professor emeritus, uh, Gods and Myths of Northern Europe, which is different from myths and symbols in pagan Europe. <laughs> And um, this also is a very interesting book. Notice here is one of those um, Scandinavian tapestries on the front, which is quite interesting as well. And I'll mention the tapestries again later. This is newly in print and available. I think it's a penguin book, so you can, you can buy this and order it. Um, here is a, a much older book. It, it's actually newly in print, but it's a much older book. Myths of the North, Norsemen from the Eddas and Sagas, and it's more like almost a dictionary of the uh, of, of all the different gods and the different characters and the different people in the Viking religion by H. A. Uh, Gerber. Uh, it was originally printed in 1929. Um, as I have cross-checked some of these, I found him not too reliable. He's kind of romantic about it, and he doesn't stick to the real story. So always cross-check with the primary sources when you look at any of these, especially older, more romantic kinds of works like this. So you need to cross-check. Um, some of the issues uh, are in 
this book that is also assigned uh, Nordic Religions in the Viking Age by Thomas A. Dubois, who takes, who looks at the religions from a really different perspective, not from the perspective of Northern Europe so much as the northern lands of the frozen north. I mean, he really looks at it from the perspective of the Viking Scandinavian and Finnish and Latvian and, and Laplanders, the Samis, and all of those people in the extreme north. So here's yet another perspective uh, from which you can look at the religion, which is a very interesting perspective. And so he compares all those different religions, but you still get at the religion. And what I want to give you tonight is more of an outline of what was going on, and uh, so that you'll have a sort of firm basis in which to con by which to connect everything. Okay, I'll mention one other source that I'm going to come to, and it's the history of the Archbishops of Hamburg Bremen by Adam of Bremen, uh, almost in pretty much an eyewitness account, pretty close to the actual time these events happened, or the, the actual recording of these events. A lot of information in here is not found anywhere else, especially about the rituals, and so I'll be mentioning that. Okay, now, what was the original condition of everything? It was called the Ganungagap, the Great Void. Originally there was chaos and everything was unformed, an original chaos. Uh, Niflheim is the realm of death north of the void and that was dark and misty with a well from which flowed eleven rivers. Muspel was to the south of the void, the void being Ganunga Gap again, and Muspel was fiery and hot, and it was presided over by the giant Surt. And the history of the creation of the world is explained as a meeting of opposites, so that the rivers of Niflheim froze, and from the cataclysmic union of hot and cold, the, the north and the south, Niflheim and Muspel, was born the giant Ymir, or Umir, I think it's pronounced Umir. And then the giant Umir's left armpit sweated offspring, okay, in a very unique way of reproduction. <laughs> and in another unique way of reproduction, one leg begat issue on the other. So, out of this, a primordial being was created by the powers of chaos, and this was a dumbla. And a dumbla was a cow whose milk gave Emir, Umir nourishment. She emerged from the melting frost and she licked the salty, salty ice blocks for food, and then she fashioned a human being, a sort of human. Uh, Buri was this human-like being fashioned by Adumbla the cow. Bor was his son, and the legends don't tell us exactly how Bor got here, but he was the son of Buri. And then Bor married a giantess who must have been a child of Umir, and the giantess was Bestla. Okay. Now, symbolically, according to Gwyn Jones, the giants represent chaos and nature, and the gods represent order and culture, so that the gods are sort of spawned by nature and by the elements, and then the gods come to bring order and culture to a, an essentially chaotic universe. And the whole story is a fundamental dialectic between them, the story of the creation of all the gods. Okay. Odin, Vili, and Ve are the three sons of Bor and the giant Besla. Okay, Bor and Besla are married. They have three sons, Odin, Vili, and Ve. And these were the first gods. Okay. Now, Bor, Bor was a human-like creature, but not a human yet, and Besla was a giant. And the giants are usually evil or, or um, attacking in some way. I mean, they, they, the, the giants are not bringers of order. They're bringers of, of disaster. Okay. 
in this triad, and notice there are threes, one of the things about the Indo-European society is they, they kind of think in threes all the time. Odin represents intellect, Vili represents will, and Ve represents the sacred. Okay, The three brothers together killed Umir and from his body formed the world. The sea and the lakes are formed from his blood, the earth is formed from his flesh, and the mountains from his bones. The rocks are formed from his teeth and his jaws, the clouds from his brains, and the sky from his skull. So he's a sort of dismembered Umir, and they <laughs> created the earth out of him. The universe is already there, but it's still kind of chaotic, and you've got all these beings that are there before the earth is created. Now we've got the earth existing out of the body of Umir. In the sky, they set sparks as stars, and they created night and day to speed across the sky, and the sun and the moon to rush unceasingly before the wolves who are ceaselessly pursuing the round disk of earth surrounded by the vast ocean. So you have this sort of picture of the sun and moon. The reason the sun and moon race across the sky is because the wolves are chasing them and if forever and, and unceasingly. Okay, the round, the earth is a round disk, not a globe, but a disk. And they think of it as a kind of flat disk, and it's surrounded by the vast ocean. The gods then, and this is our first tri triad, uh, Odin, Vili, and Ve, these gods created order and invented tools and temples. And this world they see as a Garden of Eden that they had created. It was a static world and unchanging until three giantesses started time. Okay, so we have, this is a universe that's peopled with a lot of beings other than the gods. Already we see there are giants and there are, there are um, non-personified uh, elements of, of uh, hot and cold and ice and fire in here, but there's more than just the gods. And the, the giants and the giantesses play a, a really important role, as we'll see how these gods develop. Well, Jotunheim is the home of the giants, and it's on the farther shore of ocean, and it has a stronghold within it, a kind of, uh, I guess you wouldn't call it a castle, but rather a fortress called Utgard. Now, so we have Jotunheim is the home of the giants, and Midgard, the world of men, is protected by a palisade or a, a kind of earthworks made from Ymir's eyebrows. At this point, um, we have the first two humans appearing, and this is Ask and Embla, the first man and the first woman. Uh, there are various stories about how Ask and Emla were created. Uh, either they were created by the gods from two trees, or from a tree and a creeper, or from an ash tree and an elm tree, as you can see from the names, um, uh, or from driftwood found on the seashore. At any rate, they all agree that they're made out of wood. In, in the origin. Their origin is wood from a tree or from a creeper or from driftwood. The gods then, Odin, Vili, and Ve, gave them breath or spirit and also understanding, movement, and their five senses. Okay, Midgard is the world where Ask and Embla, the first man and woman, are put to live. Asgard is the home of the gods and it's built in the middle of the world. Uh, Asgard also has a building or a hall, and this is Valhalla, the hall of the slain, the residence of the gods in Asgard, and also of brave men who died in battle. Okay, it's a, it's a, maybe a concept of heaven in a way, an interesting concept of heaven. Heaven is where warriors go, and let's see what they do when they get there. Okay. Here are some figures of gods. This is Odin for sure. Uh, and Odin is always seen with this kind of horned helmet. 
Um, this looks like another god, but I'm not sure who he is. And these are other bronze pieces. But we'll see a close-up of Odin in just a moment. Okay, Odin was the lord of Valhalla, and he lived there with his wolves and ravens and drank wine all the time. And this is characteristic of the Vikings. They all drink wine all the time, water being unsafe, although probably it was safer in the northern world than it was in southern Europe. Each day the armies of the valiant dead fought together on the meadows outside. So that this is heaven. When you go to heaven, you fight all day. And in the evening, those who were slain on the fields of Valhalla rose up and all went indoors to feast all night and meet and drink on meat and drink. So heaven is fighting all day and feasting all night. Okay, this is a wonderful warrior. And, but there's room for women there. There are women in this heaven too. And these are the Valkyries. They are made who chose the slain and summoned them from earth to Valhalla. So the Valkyries in this story go down to earth and whenever there's a battle where Vikings die, they choose the brave ones who are then going to live in Valhalla. And the Valkyries also serve the drink to the feasting warriors in Valhalla, just like maidens do when they have their courtship rituals and the maidens serve the drink to the Vikings at their feasts, uh, to the men at their feasts. So the Valkyries have this active role in um, in Valhalla. Uh, I've spelled this wrong. Uh, I sort of, sort of had a glitch on this. It's a Y and double G. Yggdrasil is how you pronounce it. Yggdrasil is the great world ash, which is central to this created world. The great world ash is called the greatest and best of trees, but it's not immortal. It's changeable and perishable. And how can the greatest being in this world, which is the world ash, which uh, some legends say predates the creation of the world, how can it be subject to corruption? It's not immortal. Okay. The name Ugrasil uh, probably means Odin's horse, and that is a synonym for the gallows. Okay, and I'll tell you why. It's a synonym for the gallows later. But the, the world ash has huge branches that reach the sky and cover the earth. It has three roots that go out to the realm of the dead, which is Niflheim, uh, the home of the frost giants, which is, what is the home of the frost giants again? Jotunheim? Uh, pardon? Jotun, Jotunheim? Uh, I think Jotunheim is the home of the giants, isn't it? Jotunheim is the home of the... Oh, Niflheim? Pardon? The frost giants, isn't it uh, Niflheim? Well, well, we'll have to... Uh, I, I have forgotten again. I'll have to... Bi no, no, it's not Bifrost. Asgard. <laughs> Sorry. Asgard is the home of... Um, uh, oh, the home of the gods, okay. The home of the frost giants is um, Jotunheim, right, okay. And the world of men, okay. I'm sorry, I'm getting confused here. Okay, Yggdrasil, and the world of men is Midgard. Yggdrasil bore up the universe, okay, held up the universe, and on its well-being depended the world. Living in sentient, it knew pain and decay. Okay, it's a living thing, it knows pain and decay. It's not immortal. Now, the reason it's called uh, Odin's horse or the gallows is because Odin hung nine days and nine nights to win wisdom on Yggdrasil, the great world ash. The wisdom that he was seeking to win was not the kind of wisdom that Plato and Aristotle had, you know, the philosophical knowledge, but rather the knowledge of magic and runes. And Odin is um, a quite a different god from the way we think of normal gods. Uh, he's very Viking. Under Yggdrasil, the holiest seat of the gods, there were daily assemblies of gods in council. So under the Yggdrasil, Yggdrasil, there was a sort of place, a holy place, where all the gods would meet together in a great council, and they were, there they would talk about the conditions of the world. Okay, here is a picture that one of my students drew uh, years ago 
uh, from this story that I've told you and, and how it all ties together. So we can, we, we haven't got all the components of it together yet, but let's look at it a little bit. Here is Yggdrasil, the, the giant um, ash tree. Here is Asgard, the world of the Aesir, or the gods. Valhalla is there, the hall of the slain. Uh, Bifrost is the bridge that goes from Midgard to Asgard. Midgard is the world of men. And here is Utgard, the citadel of the giants. And the giants live in Jotunheim over here. Uh, Niflheim is the realm of the dead. And Hel is not actually the realm of the dead. She's the goddess of the dead. And here are all the roots of the ash tree that go out to all of these different um, places within it. And we have to add some things to it. Okay, now here is our picture I promised you that we would come to again. I believe this is Yggdrasil here. Doesn't that look like a tree to you? Doesn't that look like Yggdrasil? And um, this, I think, is Sleipnir. Um, the eight-legged horse of Odin, who is his steed. Um, and here are two birds who are perched on Yggdrasil. They could be the two ravens um, that fly around the world and report back to um, Odin every day and tell him what's going on. Or one of them could be an eagle. This one might be an eagle because there's an eagle in, in Yggdrasil that perches in it. Um, and we'll see these features in a moment. This, I think, might be Thor, and the reason I think he's Thor is because here are the blacksmith's tools that he, that ha he has, and that's why I think he's Thor. This, I think, is Fenrir the wolf, who is part of this, um, um, this world that they live in. And I'm not sure who that is. Maybe we can come back to that later. This snake is the Midgard snake who encircles the whole world and holds it together. So we'll see if that works, but I think that's what this actually is. Okay, beneath the roots of Yggdrasil, the great world ash, are the wells of fate and wisdom. And uh, the Norns are three women who tended the destinies of men and they dwelt by the well of fate. Uh, the Norns are three women who are named Erd, Verdandi, and Skuld, and their names mean fate, being, and necessity, which can also be translated by translating the words as past, present, and future. Uh, uh, fate being the past that surely has happened, being is the present that we're in right now, and necessity, which is the future. We kind of have a, we have a little inkling here that maybe there is some kind of a predestination. There's a concept of destiny that the future is already planned here in this idea. Each day the Norns watered the tree from the well of fate and refreshed it with clay. In the tree, in its branches, per perched an eagle with a hawk between his eyes. And Nidhogg was one of the many snakes forever gnawing at its roots. Okay, and here are three images of women. These aren't images of the Norns, but I thought since I had so few images of women, I would at least show you some Viking women who would um, might be the Norns. Okay, this is an image of a woman up here as well. Um, they're, they're holding drinking horns, these two are, which is kind of interesting. And here are some snakes that might be nibbling at the roots. Interestingly, this is a baptismal font where these snakes are. Christian baptismal font. Um, okay, uh, up and down the tree runs Ratatosk, a little squirrel who runs up and down the trunk between Nidhogg and the eagle. And he sowed mischief between them. Deer and goats devour its shoots, and the huge trunk was invaded by rot. Of its origin, we know nothing, but it will endure until the world's end. Now, far out in the ocean is the world serpent, a giant sea monster who lives out far in the ocean and who is a great circle around the land. And he contains the whole world and the ocean and holds it together.
Okay, as long as he's alive, then the world stays together and stays functioning. Okay, you know these runes that show the snake going around in a circle and encompassing the message or the picture, I think, represent the Midgard snake. Doesn't that make sense to you? That this is what they would represent. Okay, there are two families of the gods. One family is called the Aesir, and Odin is the chief among these Norse gods of the Aesir. Odin is not a gentle Christ-like figure. He is demonic and frightening. He has a passion to know and understand. For a draft from the well of Mimir, or wisdom, he sacrificed an eye. And for the possession of magic runes, he hung nine knights on uh, the world tree, wounded with a spear. He is also god of the gallows, of war, of occult knowledge, and master of the dead. He is violent, fickle, and treacherous, and he'll lie to you, and he's not just. He doesn't reward the good and punish the evil. He will reward whoever he feels like rewarding, and he may betray you just as well. His proper worshipers are men who dealt in policy and power. Uh, men who would trick their enemies and lie to their enemies, spell makers and rune readers. So you see the kind of role model he is for the Viking aristocrats who really chose him usually as their god. And so this is their pattern for how they should behave. Here is that close-up of Odin I promised you. Maybe you can get the camera on his face. It's actually it's kind of dark, but you might be able to see a bit of his face there. And, and his features. Um, but we know it's Odin because he wears this horned helmet. Okay. Let's see it a little bit. All right. Now we'll back up. Okay. He has certain treasures, and all of the different gods have particular treasures or possessions that they hold with them, and they usually have names. And these are the treasures of Odin. Gung near his spear, drop near his gold ring, slipe near his eight-legged horse, Valhalla his hall, and my favorites, Hagen and Munnen, Thought and Memory, who are his ravens, who fly all over the world every day and spy on everybody and t come back and tell Odin what's going on around the world every night. He has many, many names, and I've only put a few here, but some of his names are Allfather, Lord of the Gallows, Evildoer, Terrifier, Father of Victory, One-Eye, Raven God, Mimir's Friend, Fenrir's Foe. That's because at, uh, at, the, at the end of the world he kills the wolf Fen Fenrir. So he's Fenrir's Foe, the High One, the Wise in Beguiling the, or Tricking, uh, the Feared One, the Serpent from his ability to assume a serpent's shape, the long-bearded, the useful advisor, and the rover, one who travels around. So you can see all of his names have kind of Viking qualities. And here is a picture of Odin on his horse, Sleipnir. We know this is his horse because he has eight legs here. So we can see his horse, um, and he's a traveler on his horse. This, I found this, and um, it's a Bracteate, and uh, the caption says it might be about uh, the two birds might recall the saga about Sigurd, but it seems to me there's also a possibility that these could be Hugin and Munnin, the two crows, if, and then this might be Odin riding his horse. Uh, again, you know, this is all guesses. We look at it and we say, what is this? And so we try to figure it out. But this is a, a Brachtiot from Jutland, and I've blown it up, of course. But here is someone, a man, riding a horse with two birds whispering in his ear, and I really think that might be Odin, um, possibly, anyway. The image seems right. Well, the next god in the triad, and, and the old-fashioned triad we, we mentioned before was Odin, Vili, and Ve, but this is soon superseded by another set of gods. And now in the Aesir we have Odin and we have Thor. So Thor is the second most important, and Thor is a god of the ordinary man. He is irascible but kindly, boisterous but straight-dealing, and Thor is a man, a, a, a god of justice. 
he does render justice to people. He's a huge eater and drinker, and he's a thunder god who rumbled in his goat-driven chariot across the heavens armed with the thunderbolt. Uh, Mjolnar is his hammer, and the iron gloves and the girdle of might doubled his strength, and those are his, those are his arms, the thunderbolt, the hammer, the iron gloves, and the girdle of might. He was red-bearded, massive, and enormously strong, and he protected Asgard and Midgard from the Midgard snake and the frost and mountain giants. So he is a protector. He is a warrior. And Thor's hammer warded off the cross. In the colonies overseas, he became the mightiest god of all. And, and maybe that's because ordinary men, the aristocrats stayed home in Norway and Sweden and Denmark. The ordinary men were the ones who went out and colonized to make their fortune. So that might be why Thor was so prominent in the colonies. And uh, this, I believe, is Thor. Um, and I'm not totally sure, but I'll check on that during the break because it's on the cover of one of these books we have. But I, I think this is Thor. Okay, at any rate, one of the most prominent symbols that's found everywhere is Thor's hammer. And here it is right here on this necklace. Actually, I'm wearing one today, and one of you noticed that I have a little Thor's hammer that I bought in the um, National Museum at Copenhagen. And here are some more pictures of Thor's hammer. Uh, various versions of Thor's hammer, uh, alongside a cross, by the way, because he wards off the cross. And here are some interesting stones where Thor's hammer was actually cast in these stones uh, so that they would cast the metal in it. Okay, the second family is, and there are a lot more people in the Acer, and I'll, I'll tell you who they are in a moment, but let's go to the second family of the gods. The second family is the Vanir. And this family of gods is not a warrior family. The ones we've already seen, the Aesir are warrior gods. The Vanir are agriculture, fertility gods that seem to have predated the Aesir. And some people think that the Vanir were the gods that were there in Scandinavia before the warrior people came, and that the Aesir are the gods of a conquering warrior people. That's a guess. We don't know for sure, but that's a guess about the gods. Uh, the Vanir have uh, three important gods, Njord, who is Earth, the father, and he is connected with the Germanic Earth mother, Nerthus. Um, and connected with Nerthus is a description of priestesses carried in a wagon to an island grove in a lake where the statue of Nerthus is purified and slaves were sacrificed amidst the reign of peace and pleasure. Okay, so, so Njord is the father and earth god, possibly related to a female Nerthus um, who preceded him. Frey and Freya are the children of Njord, uh, Njord, and they are male and female. Frey is male and Freya is female. They are gods and goddesses of fruitfulness and sexuality, and associated with them are orgiastic rites. Okay. Um, another name for Frey is Ungvi, from which the Swedish royal house took its name, the Unglingar. And uh, because they claim to be descended from Frey uh, or Ungli, and, and so uh, we have a royal house named after them. Okay, this is, um, I, this is a, a god, and I don't know what it is. I don't have a picture of... Um, Frey, but I'm guessing this might be Frey, um, but he, because he's naked, for one reason. He's a fertility god, and so, um, and so that's why I think this might be Frey. All right. Frey is associated with stallions, and he owned a wondrous boar, and, and um, the uh, Skirdismal, the sayings of Skirner, is a ritual drama of the marriage of the impregnating son and the recipient earth. Frey then presided over the rain and sunshine and all the fruits of the earth. Skidbladnir was his ship, and his ship was big enough to contain all the Aesir fully armed, and this would be a, a huge number of gods, 
but when not in use, the ship could be folded up and it could be put away in a purse and carried, you know, on your arm or in your pocket. Uh, the ship always had a favorable wind and it can be seen as a symbol of death and rebirth. And we know that some of the Vikings uh, at, at some times practiced ship burials. Um, and so this would recall Skidbladnir. Uh, it's connected to the ship bury burials and their human sacrifices as a symbol of both life and death. And so here I have a little ship that will recall Skidbladnir. And here's another ship in this rune um, uh, that's sailing on the ocean surrounded by the, the um, world snake. Okay. Freya, his sister, I think was married to Odin, according to one account. He, she seems to be married to Owen, but then the, Odin, but then there's another uh, person described as Frigg, who's also described as a woman married to Odin, and the personalities of these two women can be described differently. But nevertheless, I think they might be the same woman, and, and they've been sort of embroidered upon separately, but, uh, but uh, it's difficult to tell whether there are one or two uh, fertility goddesses here. In, at any rate, Frigg is, is the goddess of marriage and the family life, and so she's very important in, in that. Again, having to do with fertility and uh, happily married couples, and one account I read said that she keeps a kind of counterpart to Valhalla, a home where happily married couples uh, uh, go after death so that they can remain happily together in a life after death as well in her house that she keeps. Uh, Tyr is, or, or Tour is Odin's, I always forget to pronounce the Y, it's ooh is how you pronounce the Y, but Tour is Odin's brother and he's warlike but law maintaining, he obeys the laws and Ol is another brother of Odin. Baldur the Good is the son of Odin and Freya, or Odin and Frigg, uh, take your choice. And Hod is his Baldur's blind brother who ends up killing Baldur with a sprig of mistletoe at the instigation of Loki. And the reason he uses a sprig of mistletoe is because um, at one point Baldur the Good is protected uh, is sworn uh, to be protected by all living things that are important and he's given immunity from death and uh, no single thing can ever harm him but except one insignificant little twig didn't give the promise and that was the mistletoe and so Loki who is the great trickster tricked Hod Baldur's blind brother into shooting an arrow made of mistletoe at Balder, assuring him, assuring Hod that nothing could kill Balder, but he was tricked, and so Balder died. Uh, Loki is a trickster, and he is, his father was a giant, and his mother was a goddess, and so he sort of takes part in nature and chaos, and also in the order of the gods. So he's somewhere, he falls in between the two orders of the giants and the gods. He's Odin's sworn blood brother. Nevertheless, he often changes shape and he often tricks people and goes against people and breaks his word. He's very untrustworthy, but he's very Viking at the same time. Hermod rode down to hell, the goddess hell, to beg that Balder be allowed to return to earth after he died from the, the mistletoe arrow. And this was granted on condition that all things alive or dead would weep for Balder. Everyone did except Loki. And so Balder then had to stay with hell in the, in the realm of the dead until after Ragnarok, and only then could he return to the world. Heimdall was the watchman of the gods, and he was the killer of Loki. 
He's identified with Rig, the father of mankind. And you remember Rig, Rig was the hero of the story we heard about Viking society, the Rig Sula, where he was the father of, uh, remember he went to each class and he slept between the father and first the great grandfather and great grandmother and then grandfather and grandmother and then father and mother slept between them for three days and three nights and then he ends up uh, being, uh, uh, being the, the father of the children. He's also the father of the elves, the land spirits, and the dwarves. And we'll, we'll deal with these um, um, beings uh, in, in the second half of the lecture because they're, they're not really gods. They're more like the giants. They're, they're, they're imaginary beings that people the world. I mean, it's a very sentient world. It's a very living world. Everything is alive. And so they're, they're kind of spirits in the world. Worship takes place in groves and on mounds and on rocks and on islands and sacrifices are common. And again, we'll get to that in the next lecture. Well, now let's return to the story of, of the mythology of the gods. Ragnarok is the great important ending and it's the doom or the destiny of the gods. Ragnarok is destined from the world's beginning, so it's predestined. Death awaits the gods too and everything they had made. Men and gods were deeply flawed and they could be destroyed. They were not all powerful. In Asgard, the death of Odin's good and lovely son Baldur through the treachery of Loki revealed to Odin that the last dread act was at hand. In Midgard, the last age would be preceded by an age of faithlessness and depravity. All ties and restraints would vanish between kinsfolk, and you would see fratricide and incest ruling unchecked. Okay, order is breaking down, and this is going to precede the last age of Ragnarok. And then there would be a long and terrible winter that would last three years with no summers in between. What is the worst thing the Vikings can think of? <laughs> Endless winter with no summers in between. Then there would be three years of war and discord. And then Axe Age, Sword Age, Storm Age, Wolf Age, ere the earth is overthrown, chaos comes back, and there's warfare everywhere. And then three cocks will crow, one in the gallows tree, Ugdrasil, one in Valhalla, and one in Niflheim, or Hell. Then the pursuing wolves will suddenly catch both the sun and the moon and swallow them up. And here we see uh, the tree, the gallows tree, and order breaking down in Midgard and Asgard and Niflheim. Okay, the earth's bonds will crack and the mountains will fall. Fenrir the wolf, whose jaws stretch from heaven to earth, will break his fetters, and the Midgard snake spewing poison will rise from the sea. And once he does that, the earth breaks apart because he is the bounds that holds the earth and the oceans together. Uh, now far, the ship of the dead, made of the uncut nails of dead men, breaks from her moorings in hell. And the fire giants, led by Surt, come riding out of Muspel. Loki bursts free of his chains and advances to battle. Helmdahl, the watchman of the gods, then blows his horn, and now Ragnarok is here. The chosen of Valhalla prepare for the fight. Odin faces the wolf Fenrir. Thor faces the Midgard snake. Frey faces Surt, and each one destroys the other, so everyone dies. Tur and Garm destroy each other, as do Heimdall and Loki and the sun grows dark, the stars fall from the sky, and the sea invades the land. It's almost like the creation is reversed, isn't it? Where everything was ordered before, now it all falls into disorder and to chaos. Surt, the giant Surt, flings fire all over the world. The earth and heaven and the universe are all consumed, okay? but. A new order will arise. Another world will appear above the waters. 
Two of Thor's sons and two of Odin's sons will survive. Odin's sons will be the blameless Baldur and his slayer Hod, who was also blameless in a way. And the life cycle of the world will begin anew. Okay, now we've heard these stories and let's maybe look at, um, oh, I want to show you these pictures before I go on and then we'll look at something else. This is, this was a, um, a little ceremony that was going on that I photographed at the University, at the um, uh, Copenhagen uh, uh, National Museum of uh, Danish children reenacting the uh, religious rite. And so um, we can notice some familiar things. Here is Heim Helmdahl blowing the horn. Okay, maybe we ought to look at the close up. Here we see Huggin and Munnen, the Ravens. This was actually the Ravens, the Huggin and Munnen Club. And here we have um, Odin's helmet, the horned helmet that Odin wears among these children as they're learning about their heritage. Okay, um, maybe we'll go back to our, our picture of, I'd like to go back to the picture, uh, well, we'll use this one, well, let's see if we can go back to this other picture of the, the world as it was created. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I want to look at. Okay, this tracing that I think um, might be a representation of uh, the story of the creation. And let's take a look at the poems of the Elder Edda. Did any of you get a chance to read some of this um, during this week? What did you think of it? Uh, um, I've sort of mentioned to you that we don't really have a coherent story about the gods, but we have to piece it together from a lot of different things. Could you sense that in this, uh, that, that that's really what it was? Any comments? About, did you like it? So-so. <laughs> How about you in West Houston? How many do we have in West Houston? We have some people there? Three of us this evening. Three of you, good. Did you all have a... Three of us. Three? Yeah. Two, okay. Did you... <laughs> did you have a chance to read some of the poems of the Elder Edda? Uh, we've not gotten to them yet. That's, that's on the agenda, though. Yes, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. I hope it's before the midterm exam. Okay. <laughs> Maybe we'll turn to it and look at it. If you read the Velistha and you go through and you read the Velistha, it, it, uh, it's a poem that tells about the creation. Um, and it goes, you can go through it and you can see, you can trace the whole story that I told you uh, in looking at the Velistha. Hear my words, you holy gods, great men and humble, sons of Heimdall, by Odin's will. I'll speak the ancient lore, the oldest of all that I remember. So this is a very ancient thing. The Velistha goes back and it's told from memory. It's a poem recited from memory. And the author says, I remember giants of aged, ages past, those who called me one of their kin. I know how nine roots from nine worlds under the earth where the ash tree rises. Nothing was there when time began, neither sands nor seas nor cooling waves. And, and it goes on in a rather flowery way that goes through the whole things. Uh, one of the interesting things in here is the refrain that goes through it time after time. Um, uh, then all the gods met to give judgment. The holy gods took counsel together. And, and before it has this refrain, uh, the speaker says, The sun did not know where its hall would stand. The stars did not know where they would be set. The moon did not know what would be its might. Then all the gods met to give judgment. The holy gods took counsel together. They named night and night's children, gave names to morning and noon, afternoon and evening, ordered time by years. Okay, so we have the gods coming together in a council. Um, okay, the creation of Ash and Embla from two feeble trees. Note that Ash and Embla have 
no fixed fate. The gods have a fixed fate. They're going to be destroyed at Ragnarok. But Ash and Embla, the human beings, do not have a fixed fate. And so that's very important to understand the human role in this universe. Um, Odin gave them life's breath. Honir gave them mind. Lodir gave hair and fairness of face. Okay, um, now the giants cause war. We can read down further. The giants causes war. Witches cast evil spells using magic to ensnare the mind. Then, so evil has entered this world. Then, once again, the mighty gods met to give judgment. The mighty gods took counsel together. Um, and this is an important um, uh, refrain because the mighty gods taking counsel together are a mirror image of the aristocrats and the men who are the leaders of society meeting together uh, as a council to govern uh, to govern their society. So they, they see their gods as very much reflective of their own society. All right. It describes the Norns. Much wisdom have the three maidens who come from the waters close to that tree. They established laws, decided the lives men were to lead, and marked out their fates. Okay. And then it describes Odin and uh, how he gives his eye for wisdom in Mimmer's Well. And, um, and he mentions all uh, uh, of these gods. Um, and then it goes on and it describes Ragnarok. And everybody who, brothers will die slain by their brothers, kinsmen be betray their close kin, the doom that awaits the almighty gods. Even the gods cannot escape their fate. Great is my knowledge. I can see the doom that awaits the almighty gods. The world girding serpent rises from the water. The sky splits open. And now we have a new refrain. Great is my knowledge. I can see the doom that awaits almighty gods. Okay, what, what do you make of this? The fact that the gods are going to die at the end of the story. What do you think about that? What, what might that mean about the Vikings? Any thoughts? What kind of gods are these who can't save the world? They can't even save themselves. Yeah. One idea that kind of struck me was that it seems the gods are all related to uh, living creatures and maybe the Vikings could relate this to the environment and keeping in check with the environment, making sure that the environment doesn't die because that's, I guess, your life. And if it does, you get the breakup of the world. Yeah, maybe the environment will die, but, but it dies. I mean, the whole world dies. But then it's reborn in a new world. Um, and the gods die. They're fallible gods. They're not immortal. Baldur is sort of resurrect resurrected at the end, and Hod. But the rest of the gods die. So we have gods that die. Does this tell us anything about Viking character that, that comes to your mind, that it would tell us anything about them? It's rather pessimistic. It's pretty pessimistic, yeah, good, good. It's pretty pessimistic. They, they, they have this sort of sense of, of, of a feeling of life after death, but then, but then it all ends and the gods all die. Uh, it's not forever. It's only for a, a, a set period of time until time comes to an end. Do um, you think it's a recognition that everything dies and that they're going to die? I mean, um, one of the things we see about the Vikings is they're not particularly scared of death. And they're, they're sort of willing to plunge into death, aren't they? I mean, they're willing to throw themselves into heroic actions, and they don't seem to care if they die. Um, just maybe it's reflected in this religion, the idea that uh, their gods are going to die too, that not only will they die, but their gods will die too, uh, which is a kind of interesting thought. Well, when they die, they also have look at um, going to Valhalla 
and fighting with their gods at the end. Ah, true, but Valhalla doesn't last forever. Because when Odin dies, Valhalla's gone, right? So heaven doesn't... Yes, that's correct, but what I'm saying is, what I was saying is up to that point where the world dies, they will fight with their gods at the end and go down together. Good, okay, they'll go down together with their gods, that's true. They'll go down together with Odin. Uh, fighting a warrior's death, by the way, all these gods, and, and slaying the giants. And the giants kind of represent evil in a way um, here. But um, it's a different sense of evil than w that we find in Christianity. It's like evil exists in the natural world in a way. Doesn't it seem to you like it's... it's do you, you can disagree with me. I'm interpreting here as we go along. Um, it seems to me that it sees evil as part of the natural world and that it's accepted. Like death is an evil thing to people, but, but they have to accept it because that's reality. Um, the world ash rots and it has snakes eating at it and it has goats nibbling at it and, and uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it deteriorates, but it, it, it survives actually. Uh, Ragnarok. Yeah, did you have a comment? Well, it's interesting how in their cosmology, um, certain animals that help them are seen as good with their gods, and animals that could harm them or harm their, uh, you know, their holdings, like their animals, you know, like uh, Fenrir the wolf, yeah. are perceived as, as evil or at least, you know, not good. And, and I think that's the distinction there is that, you know, there's... Uh, Maybe these stories, as they were told, you know, to children, help them, you know, and learn in the mindset. You know, for instance, if they saw a wolf, I don't think wolves really attack humans, but they needed to know that they could harm their livestock. Well, wolves would attack humans if they if they um, saw that humans were weak. I mean, you know, if they had the opportunity. But is it because wolves are evil? Is that why they attack humans? And and uh, and. And, and, and livestock, why? Uh, pressure mic. <laughs> okay. I was just making a comment. They also are the ones that consume the sun and the moon. They consume the sun and the moon. Well, do they do that because they're evil? I mean, they, their job is to chase the sun and the moon uh, ceaselessly. Well, that's their place in the entire, in, in the realm of things. It's their place in nature. Isn't, isn't that their nature? I mean, wolves chase people and they eat people up, <laughs> and they eat animals up. But that's what wolves do. Isn't that what wolves do? Is it evil? Do you see it as evil? What do you think? It, it seems like everything's very practical. Oh, it's very practical. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Well, it's, it's all based on what really happens. There's no fantasy or... Um, Not yet. <laughs> in reality or... Yeah. So far, we have well. There's sort of a fantasy, but it's it's um, uh, but it's it's really rooted in reality. Wait till we get to the elves and the dwarves, and then we'll see some fantasy. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Their religion is based in terms that they can understand and relate to. They can really understand it because it's very rooted in the natural world. Everything is rooted in the natural world, and it, it acknowledges the natural world. I mean, are snakes basically evil in this story? They're not evil, they're just doing their thing. You know, they do what snakes do, and wolves are doing what wolves do. But then you have someone like Loki. What do you make of him? He's a wild card in human nature. Or maybe he's the luck factor, because the Vikings are very into luck. Yeah, you think Loki might be the luck factor? What do you think of Loki? The trickster, the deceiver. The cheater, the shape changer who goes behind people's backs and who betrays Balder the good. I mean, first he shoots him with the mistletoe when he knows that mistletoe is the only thing that will kill him. I mean, he gets hard to do it. It's even more underhanded. And then he's the only living thing that won't weep and let Balder come back from hell. So what do you make of Loki? Well, he explains why fairness isn't always part of life. Okay, okay, maybe justice isn't part of life. Because it's not a guarantee. It's not guaranteed. 
Odin is not a just god. He doesn't necessarily reward you. He hands out favors according to his whims, not according to your desert and what you deserve. Okay, so that's a recognition of a lack of justice in the universe. I mean, um, it's not necessarily just that um, your sheep might be eaten by a wolf, but that's the wolf's nature. And so that's what happens in reality. So maybe that's it. Well, let's turn to maybe another reading. And um, this is the Lay of Vathrudner. It's a kind of an interesting lay. It, it starts out really interestingly, I think. Um, the, la the Lay of Vathrudner. Odin says to his wife Frigg, Would it be a good thing, Frigg, were I to go and make a visit to Vathrudner? I've been longing to match my lore against that giant's wisdom. And Frigg says, I would rather Odin remained here at home with the gods. I believe Vafredner can boast of being quicker witted, the quickest witted of his kind. But Odin said, Far have I traveled. I've tried many things against the gods to prove my powers. Now I must visit Vafredner's home and learn how the giant lives. Okay, Odin is very shrewd and very smart, and he wants to test his wit against the wittiest of the giants. He wants a game. Okay, these Vikings are very into games. Right. Frigg said, okay, you want to go safely, safely return. May you rejoice in your journey, father of men. May you find your wisdom surpasses the giant's skill. Then Odin left to test his learning against Vafthredner's lore. The fierce one found the hall of Im's father and walked in without delay. And so he says, hail, Vafthredner, I'm here in your hall to see what you look like. I've come to find out if they call you wise, rightly or wrongly, giant. And so they test their wits against each other. Okay. Um, Vathredner said, Gadnerod, Gan tell me if you'd rather try your luck with both feet on the floor. What is the horse called who climbs the heavens, drawing behind him day? And Odin replies, that is the sun horse, shiny mane, who brings the brightness of day. Okay. He is considered the best of his kind. The light never leaves his mane. Uh, Vathrenir said, uh, Gagnard, tell me if you'd rather try your luck with both feet on the floor. What horse comes eastward, climbing the sky to give sweet night to the gods? And Odin replied, Rinfaxi, frost mane, draws forth night, giving pleasure to the gods. Okay, this is the horse that draws the moon in the other direction. So he's answering all the questions. Uh, uh, Vafredner said, uh, what is the river which runs between the giant's land and the gods? And Odin replies, the river Ifing. Okay, now let's see. So Vafnir is asking all these questions. Uh, and finally, Vath, uh, Vath Radnir says, Guest, you've proved your learning. Take your place. Come talk to me on the bench. Here in this hall, let the loser's head fall to the winner's wisdom. Okay, now the, the contest is reversed. They love games and contests. Uh, Odin said, To my first question, can you reply, Vath Radnir, learn it in lore? What was the source of the earth and sky, wise giant? How were they formed? And Vathredner replies, The earth was formed from Umir's flesh, rocky cliffs from his bones, the frost giant's skull became the sky, his salty blood the sea. Okay, now Odin asks the second question, What made the moon which looks down on men? What is the source of the sun? And the reply is, Mundilfokri is the moon's father. He is the sun's sire, too. Each day they circle around the sky. That's how men measure time. Okay, and so he, um, he goes through and he asks all these stories of uh, all these questions. He's asked five, six, uh, seven, eight question. Okay. And we won't. Uh, where do men take 
Here's the eleventh question. Where do men take arms and fight to the death each day? And Vath Threadnir replies, The valiant warriors who wait in Valhalla fight to the death each day. When the slain are brought back from the battle, they all sit in peace again. And so Odin then asks, How do you know so much about Valhalla, about the gods, the lore of giants? You make no mistakes with your wide wisdom. And Vathredner replies, About the gods and the lore of the giants, I can tell the truth, having seen all I know. Nine worlds I know under Niflhelm, where the dead are sent to dwell. Odin said, Far have I traveled. I've tried many things against the gods, proved my powers. Who will be left of living men when three winters see no summer? And so then Vathredner knows about... Um, uh, about the uh, uh, Ragnarok, and he tells the whole story uh, about that uh, with Ragnarok. Okay. And finally, we get to the end where the All Father um, Odin actually uh, defeats Vathredner. Odin says, Far have I traveled, I've tried many things, against the gods prove my powers. What words did Odin whisper to his son when Balder was placed on the funeral pyre? And Vathredner said, There is no one living who knows what words were the last you spoke to your son. Death was my witness when I told the doom that lies in wait for the world. All my lore is less than Odin's, your wisdom will always win. So Odin actually wins, although he has the whole story. Uh, uh, Vafthredner can't know the one thing that Odin himself knows and what he would say to his son. So we, we get the story again of uh, the story of creation and the story of Ragnarok uh, in, that, in that story. Okay. Um, Skirner's journey. Okay, this is about Njord's son. Frey, who is looking out over all the worlds. In Jotunheim, he saw a very beautiful maiden as she walked from her father's fall to her, uh, hall to her own. From that moment on, he was heartsick. Frey had a servant called Skirner. Njord asked him to try to get Frey to talk. Then Skadi said, Get up, Skirner. Go and try to speak to our son. Find out why... Frey, who has wisdom, is now so sad. And then it goes through the story. Um, uh, eventually, what happens is, um, Freya said, In Geimer's court, I saw going by the one I love. So white were her shining arms, they lit the sky and sea. No one ever in all the world has loved a maiden so much. Among the Aesir, among the elves, no one wants me to win her. Skirner then said, Give me your horse to ride through the ghostly ring of flickering flames, and give me your famous sword that will fight by itself against any giant. And so um, uh, Frey gives them to him, and Skirner is then going to go and uh, fight for the girl. Skirner rode into Jotunheim and found Gimir's court. Savage dogs were tied to a wooden fence surrounding Gerd's hall. He rode to where a herdsman sat on a grave mound and said to him, Can you tell me, herdsman, as you keep watch looking all around you, how can I manage to meet the maiden despite Germer's dogs? In, in any case, if you go on, um, uh, the story is of Skirner is how he goes and fights the battle for Frey. Okay. It's a very long story, but it's an interesting story. Um, and what he does in the end is um, he actually does win the maiden. Uh, Gerd said, To your health, fair youth, accept this foaming cup filled with fine mead. I never believed that I could be so fond of Frey. And so Skirner then uh, wins the girl for Frey. Okay. 
It has been suggested that this reflects a Frey cult, according to Peter Hallberg, a fertility rite in which the earth goddess marries the sun god, okay, as a fertility one. So you can see how these uh, stories, then you have to put them all together and you have to, um, and you have to piece together the whole story, but elements are contained in each of these stories and so you can piece together the entire story which I essentially gave you. Uh, let's go back for the last minute that we have and maybe look at this um, look at this rune again, this rune stone. And um, what do you think? Do you think my identifications are correct here? This has to be uh, Yggdrasil. This has to be the ash tree. Anybody have any ideas for these other characters? that you can see. This might not be Thor, or we might have two representations of Thor, because here Thor is the one who kills the Midgard snake, and so this may represent Ragnarok and Thor killing the Midgard snake. Any ideas here for the whole story? In everything I've read, it's identified it as um, the Sigurd story. Yeah, I've and seen think, it identified yeah. as the Sigurd story, and too. I think it's really neat to hear a different interpretation of it, because it's always just that one thing, but both interpretations could be valid, and we just don't really know. Um, I think it's interesting that that's the rune stone, isn't it, that was raised um, either by or for a woman named Sigurd? Yes. Yes. So I wonder if there's mm -hmm. a connection there, if mm -hmm. it might be the Sigurd story. But either way, it works. It works either way, yeah, yeah. And, and so you can sort of see the Sigurd story, but, but what, what, is it, what is the tree in the Sigurd story? I don't remember what the tree is. I think it's just there as a vehicle for the birds. <laughs> oh, okay, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a vehicle for the birds. I don't know, but you know, this does fit in with the Sigurd story. Uh, somebody's beheaded in the story, and this is the guy who forges the famous sword in the Sigurd story, and this would be his magical horse. The horse does not have eight legs. True. But anyway. Okay, well, let's go ahead and take our break, and when we come back, we'll look at how the rituals are, are um, carried out and, uh, and those elves and dwarves. I know you're anxious to hear how they fit in.